Hi, I'm Ovik Roy with Roy Healthcare Research, and I'm here with Silvio Itescu, the CEO of Mesoblast, an Australian biotech company with a $1.8 billion market cap last time I checked, which, uh, which is pretty impressive for a company at your stage of development. I'd love to get your thoughts on why you think investors are so excited about what you're doing. Well, I think there's, there's a number, number of issues. First of all, I think we've got the best adult stem cell technology in the world, a technology that's, that's been shown to be highly effective um, to deliver products for some very large unmet medical needs, including cardiovascular medicine, diabetes, neurologic conditions, orthopedic diseases, uh, and uh, inflammatory and autoimmune conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, secondly, we've, um, we've got some terrific strategic partnerships. Uh, our uh, partnership with Teva uh, is an important one. Uh, they're, they're our, uh, they have exclusive rights to distribute certain of our products in cardiovascular and neurological diseases uh, throughout the world. Uh, our, our strategic partnership with Lonza, the world's number one biologics company uh, for manufacturing, um, for, for, uh, we, we have exclusive access uh, for allogeneic cell therapy to their state-of-the-art plant in Singapore and we expect them to help us build out facilities as, as our capacity needs uh, demand them. And uh, finally, we've, we're very well cashed up. We've got about $240 million in cash. All of those things together in a, in a bad global market means that we're well ahead of the pack um, and we're well poised to, uh, to successfully commercialize products in, in large unmet medical needs. So tell us, Silvio, about this technology. What are mesenchymal precursor cells and why do you think they have so many applications? So they're unique cells that are present in all of us. They're present around blood vessels, in the bone marrow, in fat tissue, in dental pulp, in all of our organs. Uh, the unique nature of these cells is that they respond to signals in the damaged tissue by releasing a variety of factors, um, organelles, mitochondria, that, that help the local tissue repair itself. Uh, and so we identified these cells at a single level, very, very pure populations of these cells. We extract them um, from healthy individuals and then take advantage of two important technical components which is they can be grown up in very large numbers and number two they don't activate the immune system and so potentially they can give rise to a, an industrial scale manufacturing process that resembles in every way pharmaceutical drug development with batch to batch consistency and um, each, each product being the same as the next with uh, under, understandable release criteria that the FDA and other regulatory bodies are comfortable with. That allows us to, to build a, a manufacturing capability that looks like drug development, that has a very low cost of goods capability and a high margin for us, uh, and um, with a very potent product. The, uh, the, the ability to, to take product from one donor, healthy young donor, and potentially develop 15,000 therapeutic doses means that this is really an industrialized uh, process. We think we've got very pure populations of these very potent cells whose job it is in, in general to maintain the health of an individual throughout their lifespan. Uh, so the, the logic here is to identify these cells, grow them up and understand what specific tissue repair and regeneration they're useful for. And, and what sort of clinical data do you have to date uh, that's helped you understand where the best directions to take this technology are? So we're driven by good science and, and we've uh, spent over 10 years in developing the, the underlying science in uh, both in, in the laboratory and then in animal models to give us go-no-go no go decisions before we ever go into clinical trials. Uh, and then on the basis of positive results we've moved into a number of large areas uh, where we've worked with the FDA and other global regulators through phase two and now into phase three in areas as diverse as congestive heart failure, type two diabetes, and intervertebral disc repair. Uh, in, in congestive heart failure, we've completed a 60 patient phase two trial where we've tested three doses against placebo. And what we showed is that a single injection of the highest dose directly into damaged left, left uh, ventricles of, of patients with severe heart failure um, resulted in a significant reduction in heart failure hospitalizations and mortality over as long as three years of follow-up in comparison to the controls. Uh, any, any drug developer wanting to develop a novel, novel approach for heart failure, which is the world's number one uh, cause of hospitalization and, and, and death in industrialized nations, uh, has to demonstrate a, a benefit 
in terms of reduction in hospitalizations and reduction in mortality. And we showed that significantly with as few as 60 patients. To what, was, what was the statistical difference in that study? Uh, the controls had, a, had an event rate of, of approximately 20% over the, a two year period of 18 month period of follow-up. Well, by event rate, you mean incidence of hospitalization and death? Or, or death, what? that's right. And the controls who received the highest dose had a zero event, event rate over that same period of time. Now, if we see exactly that again in a phase three trial, we probably wouldn't need more than about 500 patients to, to get approval for the product. Um, we're being a little bit more conservative than that, uh, and we're wanting to establish safety across many more patients. So we anticipate commencing a phase three program uh, over the next couple of months that is of, of a size of approximately 1,500 patients. Now, we've already met with the FDA and we've met with the European regulators, and they're very excited uh, at the phase two data, at the safety profile of the pro product, and uh, have clearly indicated that they're very excited for us to move forward into phase three, and we expect to commence that phase three uh, quite shortly. You said you studied three doses in that trial of uh, MPC plus uh, placebo. Was there a consistent uh, increase in uh, or decrease in uh, mortality and hospitalization as you increased the dose? So, so at all doses, we showed a reduction in mortality. Uh, only the highest dose actually demonstrated both a reduction in mortality and hospitalization. And the highest dose, in addition, showed concordance with a number of what are called surrogate markers, secondary markers, including a reduction in the size of the left ventricle significantly over 12 months and a significant increase in what's called functional capacity, the ability of, of patients with severe heart failure to walk over 50 meters more over a 12-month period than, than uh, the controls. Um, together, uh, those features suggest that the highest dose was much better than the two lower doses in terms of what's called um, improving the remodeling and the anatomy of the left ventricle, which is really the objective of, of patients with heart failure. But it's highly consistent, actually, with the, with the results that we had in two previous sheep studies. Uh, one study looking at ischemic heart failure, and one study looking at non-ischemic heart failure, where, again, the optimal dose range was in the range of 110 to 225 million cells. The highest dose in patients that worked optimally was 150 million cells, right in the middle of the optimal ranges in animals. So the nice thing about this technology is, A, safety at this point in time is clear. We've had no adverse events at any dose tested. No grade three or grade four adverse events? Nothing, no adverse events. And just as important, um, maybe more important, is the predictability of animal models in terms of being able to, to, to predict outcomes and translate those outcomes from animal models to humans. And I think there seems to be a much closer correlation in, in this type of technology between uh, animal model versus human than there is with small molecules. And that's not surprising because biologics are biologic. They, they, they behave in a similar way irrespective of the species, whereas small molecules, uh, as, as, as you'd be very uh, aware, um, uh, can be quite idiosyncratic in terms of the type of reactions and the type of effects they can have from one species and whether that can be translated or not to man. How long does it take for these cells to integrate into the, the cardiac tissue and really become functional heart muscle? Now the mechanism of action is actually quite unique and in fact the cells do not integrate. Okay. The cells are really um, smart delivery vehicles for growth factors, for reparative factors, for transfer of organelles like mitochondria. Um, the fact that the cells don't activate the immune system means they don't get rejected, they don't cause an inflammatory response and when we put them into the heart they um, survive for up to a couple of months. They then die through natural causes but during that period of a couple of months they release the appropriate factors following instruction by, by the damaged heart. And those factors are able to recapitulate and regenerate blood vessels, um, cause heart muscle cells to start dividing and growing, and reduce the scar and fibrosis that is a hallmark of heart failure. And uh, we've mapped the various factors that the cells make and how they impact on this recovery process. And what, uh, what sort of, you've done a 60 patient study, so, and, you're, and you're thinking that you're gonna do 1,500 for the phase three. Usually the FDA wants you to do a certain amount of, uh, a certain duration uh, of time and also a certain number of patients to get the safety stuff down before doing a large phase three study. What sort of, what sort of safety requirements have they placed? It sounds like they're letting you go straight into phase three. Well, again, we've, we've implanted more than 150 patients across multiple indications with these cells and we've done hundreds of large animal studies. And again, to date, we've never seen 
even a single adverse event linked to the cells. So that is, is, is establishing a very, very deep safety um, compendium for, for the FDA and for all indications. Uh, clearly, the, the FDA looked at our data and was comfortable that in the, even in this small number of patients, the, the lack of any adverse events uh, is not likely to preclude moving forward. Now, obviously, as we move into a larger trial, we have uh, a number of, of interim stops and reviews to ensure that an oversight committee can review the data, make sure there have been no safety concerns. The first 100 patients, for example, will be reviewed by the Safety Monitoring Board. When halfway through the trial has been recruited, the Safety Monitoring Board again will review. So we have many safety checks to ensure there are no safety concerns. Um, however, assuming that, 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 that safety continues to be um, without, without an issue, the ability to continue to enroll uh, and, and to end up with the kind of efficacy endpoints to demonstrate that you've got an, an approvable drug, I think is a very important uh, achievement by the company. And I think it also indicates that the FDA feels that this is a very, very important unmet need and they're supporting novel therapies that have a chance of really changing the paradigm of treatment for these patients. Where, when would you expect that first safety look to take place? Well, assuming that we commence this trial by the end of the third quarter, um, we anticipate the full, full patient of recruitment to take about 18 months. So the first 100 patients will probably be recruited over about three to four months. Yeah. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we will certainly make available to the, to the public uh, clarity that, that the Safety Monitoring Board has reviewed the first 100 patients, there have been no safety concerns, and the trial continues. And how's the, how do the economics work between you and Teva? Are they funding the trial? Are you funding it, or is it shared? Uh, no, they're funding the trial phase three completely. Um, we have an understanding that, um, that, that uh, in exchange for funding the trial, they have the rights to distribute the product at the end. We share um, the revenues uh, on net sales in a, in a particular, particular way. Um, they have the obligations to, to fully fund sales and marketing costs, and we have the obligation to fully fund manufacturing costs. Uh, and uh, we will be providing them on a transfer price basis product, um, which will reflect really the division of, of uh, net sales. How would you compare, from a commercialization standpoint, uh, what you'll need to do compared to, say, what Dendrion had to do with Provenge, another cell-based therapy that's, that's had some challenges commercially? It's a fairly different situation than yours, but just explain that for investors who might be familiar with that situation. Look, I think, I think that's a very, very important point. From day one, um, we sourced this particular technology not only because, in our view, it was the best cell therapy approach for regenerative medicine, in, a, in our opinion, but also because it was the right way to build a business model. We, we understood from the beginning that patient-specific autologous therapies have real problems in terms of scalability, in terms of cost of goods, etc. And so we needed a cell type that could be uh, used allogeneically from one donor to potentially provide 15,000 or more therapeutic doses because that, that allows us to leverage our entire manufacturing and allows us to reduce our cost of goods very significantly. So the difference using an autologous patient-specific approach for the disease that we're targeting um, would be that the cost of goods might be um, really as, as, as much as 10 times the cost of what our therapy is going to cost for us to make, uh, given the, the, the economies of scale. So from that point of view, I think we're very different from Dendrion. Dendrion is really personalized medicine, where we are much more pharmaceutical-like in our manufacturing and development. Makes sense. And so what other clinical data should we expect? You have some other programs, maybe you want to talk about those, or what, what will be the next, over the next 12 to 18 months, what will investors see in terms of, uh, of clinical development milestones? Sure, so we're in, in the middle of a 100 patient phase two trial for regenerating intervertebral discs. Uh, a simple injection into the disc space to reduce pain and improve function with a six month primary endpoint. We expect that trial to complete recruitment by the end of the third quarter and uh, hopefully by the first quarter of next year we'll have efficacy data to allow us to make a, a decision around moving towards phase three. And that's a very important, uh, it's a very large market, 10 million patients in the US suffer with low back pain and today there is no alternative other than for maybe 10% of those patients to move towards spinal fusion surgery. Uh, the other big area that we're currently involved in is in a phase two trial for type two diabetes. We've shown in preclinical studies in both um, mice and more recently non-human primates that a single injection of our cells 
intravenously in a dose dependent manner resulted in, in um, significant normalization of blood glucose over as long as six months in uh, non-human primates with type 2 diabetes. The mechanism of action are quite interesting. They relate to reduction of inflammation, reduction of, of abnormal cytokine production, uh, and, and an increase in certain hormones that cause the pancreas to make more insulin and cause the adipose tissue to respond better to insulin in terms of insulin sensitization. Um, and uh, we have started a phase two trial testing, again, three doses versus placebo to show that we can duplicate over a three month period better glucose control uh, in patients who are otherwise not responding well. We expect that th this program, which is initially geared for safety, will allow us to move into the real complications of type two diabetes, notably uh, renal disease and fatty liver disease. Fatty liver disease is a major problem now in terms of um, it's becoming one of the major causes of, of um, cirrhosis uh, and it's reflective of the epidemic of type 2 diabetes. So um, we will be moving into those large areas and taking advantage again hopefully of the fact that the cells not only can reduce, uh, can improve glucose control but reduce the inflammation that is ultimately damaging these end organs. And is Teva funding those trials as well? No. So Teva's Teva is our partner strictly in the areas of cardiovascular and, and uh, neurologic disease. For the broader uh, inflammatory diseases that we're targeting with intravenous delivery, which is uh, in the areas of diabetes, pulmonary diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, um, those areas remain unpartnered. Our orthopedic indications such as disc repair and, and uh, bone repair are also unpartnered. And we have you know, terrific funds and resources available to take some of those products through to phase three on our own. But I would uh, hope that as, as results come to hand, we will be in discussions with a number of other large pharma partners who have the, the capability and distribution in those areas. Uh, it is possible that as we continue to work with Teva that they may want to, to uh, work with us in some other areas other than the cardiovascular neurologic space, uh, but I think that remains an open question. Remind me how much cash you said you have on hand? About $240 million. And how long do you think that's going to last you? Um, on the phase two programs that we've currently got budgeted, we, we have enough money for four years. Four years. But I would, I would expect that, as, that, that when we have some good results in any of these phase two programs, we would obviously be in a position to start some additional phase threes and we would probably at that point um, require some additional funds, but that's a, that's a good news story at that point. Great, absolutely. So Mesoblast listed in Australia, but with an ADR in the United States as well. Silvio Tescu, thanks for joining us uh, this afternoon. Thank you.